if you see the plaque in your coronary arteries. And as we say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, as a family doctor, almost 28 years now, when we had first learned about the calcium score, we thought that it was a test just to drive patients to the cardiologist. Right, right. And I've certainly learned a lot over the years now and realized how powerful a tool it is. And it seems to me that it should be really in the hands of the primary care doctors. Yep. Those are the ones that should be ordering the test. And you were alluding to it previously, how do we educate primary care doctors? Right. How do we educate the general public? And it's tough because also, you know, and, and uh, you know, obviously every country is a little bit different, but in the United States, our primary mechanisms to educate the primary care doctors are, are large conferences. And, and many primary care doctors take the time out of their practice to go to these conferences. The problem is they don't always have imaging as part of that, and they don't always have screening as part of that. So I think that we just need to continue to try to work that into their general education while getting it into the literature that the primary care doctors will, will read to make sure that the primary care doctors are also those, you know, they can read the article and understand or appreciate the need for, for this test and the role for this test and in whom. It's not for everybody, for sure. We need to decide who would benefit the most. So, so sad to say, I submitted a proposal to the uh, uh, American Academy of Family Physicians to one of their FMX national conferences. I've been actually doing it for years um, related to nutrition and, right. and prevention to um, discuss calcium score. And I don't know if it, they don't like me, but um, I was turned down. And yeah. I was really excited to, to bring the technology to the group. Yeah, AFP is very against it for some reason, because I've, I've tried to get into their journals as well and write review articles for their journal so that I figured people might read that journal and learn a little about the test or hear about it, you know, in a review article. And they also are not, they, at least they weren't in the past, receptive to a review article. I could reapproach the editors and see if they'd be receptive to a review article uh, on screening on, for heart disease and talking about these things. But, but in the past, they've not been receptive as a group. Yes, I agree. In fact, if I have this correct, after the 2013 guidelines came out, the AFP came out with a statement stating that they don't find that there's evidence to support calcium scans. Really? Wow. Yeah, so maybe we can, maybe every year there's a new president, maybe sooner or later the right person will be in the right place. Well, sometimes it just takes that confluence yeah. to get these things out, uh, where you get the reasonable person at the top who can, who can uh, let us move forward with this. Um, and I'm trying to work with the National Lipid Association, which has a fair number of primary care doctors, and we're trying to work with, you know, the uh, diabetes organizations and the cardiology organizations to, to, get, to get the word out, and we continue to try to do that, but, but uh, I found the uh, AAFP to be especially uh, challenging, and for reasons of that far escape me. I just don't understand their reluctance to, to look at it, because I think the literature uh, objectively is very positive and there are no more debates about whether or not we should do calcium scoring. Sometimes the debates are in whom we should do it or how frequently we should do it, but never should we do it in general. Those debates are long gone. That's, that's a well-established, uh, at least among the, the preventive cardiology community, that's a well-established um, fact already. So we just know that the patients benefit, that we show them this image and they, they can know years ahead right. as to what's going on. It, it's just so powerful to wish primary care doctors could do some of the traditional things that we do to assess cardiovascular risk, but when you're talking about um, a, a surrogate test such as measuring a cholesterol, which has value compared to just seeing the disease process, it's yep. a marker of disease process as I understand it. That's night and day. Yeah, and it certainly works better. Compliance-wise, it's been well studied that you're much more likely to adhere as a patient to these therapies if you see the plaque in your coronary arteries. And as we say, a picture is worth a thousand words. You show them their coronary arteries and you say, look, you're starting to pl plug up the pipes. They start acting more as better patients. And I think that's critical to this whole process. And equally, people who may have an appearance of risk factors, but they get a zero, those guys don't go out and just start eating junk food. They, they right. want to protect their zero. Once it's explained to them, they say, wow, 
They want to protect right. it. And I tell, I, I use the analogy of an HIV test. I said, if you lived a bad lifestyle and you got an HIV test and it's negative, that doesn't mean you're immune to the disease and can continue to do those things that put you at risk. You just got lucky to this point in time and you best, you best uh, continue to behave well or start to behave well uh, or else. So I don't think a calcium score is a lifetime guarantee. It just says up until this point, so far, you haven't caused any permanent scar tissue in the coronary arteries. And if you double down and keep doing what you're doing good, maybe stopping some bad in spite of the zero, right. you may get to retain it and retain that very low risk. Exactly, Excellent. exactly. So it tends to not be a negative, and that's been studied as well. It's not a negative motivator. In other words, people don't say, oh, I have a score of zero, I'm going to start smoking cigarettes, or I'm going to start, I'm going to start eating poorly. I mean, they might celebrate once and go out and have a burger, but they're not, going to, they're not going to change their lifestyle to the worse just because of the score of zero. But the positive score has a huge impact on their behavior. And we've seen weight loss, we've seen more aspirin use, more cholesterol use, more blood pressure use, and better exercise um, among those patients. So they change everything from their diet to their, to their exercise, to their, to their medications, uh, to the positive when they find out they have a high score. And that's really rewarding to know that we're making a difference in those patients. We're finding some patients get a bit obsessed <laughs> That's the problem. That is the one problem is they do, some patients do get a bit obsessed with their score. And I had a woman email me yesterday, her score went up and she's frustrated now because her score is going up despite doing all of these good things. And, you know, so we talked about what else she could do. But yeah, at some point, sometimes you have to cut them off uh, from any test. Uh, <laughs> tell them to not, not, not get too obsessed with this. It's, uh, it's important, but it's not, it's not the only thing that they need to worry about in their, in their life. And, and I'll just finish with this to say that um, on camera, Ivor and I both have zero scores. And I celebrated for a day or two, I have to, in all yep. fairness. <laughs> there you go. Now that's, that's very healthy, but that's fine. But there's nice competitive pressure now. How, how, who can keep the zero the longest into uh, the future? Uh, uh, uh. Well, <laughs> yeah, excellent. Good. It's a pleasure. Thanks thank very you. much, no, Thank you for coming up.